how to create more videos in less time. And we have 10 productivity tips, two special guests. I'm going to welcome our first guest, Jen from The Sewing Report. Jen, welcome to The Challenge. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm excited. So fired up to have you on. For those that are just meeting you, tell us about your journey on YouTube. I'll share the screen and show your channel here. And what is it you do and when was it you started? Hi, I'm an ex news producer turned sewing enthusiast and I started my channel in 2016. I believe I joined VRA in maybe 27. I think I joined in 2017 or 2018. And I've been a full time creator for about six years. Uh, I have a few different channels, but this is the the main one. And I love doing it and things are going well this year. So I'm excited to get going. I love it. And what's uh like the the value proposition of your channel making sewing fun I, and approachable what's yeah the i i'm not a sewing expert or a sewing teacher i really try to come at it from an an everyday person so i do reviews i also do tutorials but i really try to break down the information so it's it's not intimidating i think that's a problem in the sewing community and uh there's also a lot of gatekeeping or people being like oh my gosh you're doing this wrong and i really try to be uh, very, very approachable and, and, you know, very, I don't take myself too seriously. And there's a lot of different ways of doing different sewing techniques. And I really try to uh, showcase it in a very realistic way. So I think that I think that resonates. I love that. All right. And then our second guest today is Rad from Unity Gym. Rad, what time is it right now where you're at? And then tell us when you started YouTube and what you're up to on YouTube. Right now it's 5.22 a.m. I was up at 4.20 a.m. So you have to excuse me if I've got that uh, sleep look in my face. Uh, so I have been running the Unity Gym channel now. I think we started back in 2014, around that time. Um, we joined VRA and I say we because my brother was actually, who's my business partner, that's my brother on screen there with the red hat. He was the one that joined VRA and he used to manage our channel back then. And so we joined in 2017. Uh, it just took off. I took over managing the channel when we sold our gym in our physical location of our gym in 2021. And now we're a full time online business. So yeah, these are some of our older videos. They're looking, that's uh, uh -huh. reminds me of how far we've come. Uh, and now I manage the channel full time. And that's my main role in our business. And I love it. Man, so awesome. And uh, thank you for jumping on the session today. We're going to kick it off with uh, 10 tips and kind of talked off camera and before. Um, tip number one is start simple. And so we'll start with you, Jen. And we're talking about, you know, how to actually get videos done. I think as both people look at your setups or we look at the videos today, it's like, oh, man, it seems so effortless. You've got, you know, Jen, right now you're coming from this cool studio and lighting all behind you. But uh, and you have a background in media. So talk maybe though about like day one creating videos and just the mindset you had to start before everything was perfect. Yeah, sure. I do think when I talk to people about starting YouTube channels, they tend to really overthink things and think they need to have expensive gear. They need to have an elaborate setup. They need to have like videos like Mr. Beast. And I don't think that's true. I think you can start off with a phone. You can start off, you know, this is not a fancy camera here, but I think the, the key about starting YouTube is making it easy for you to shoot the videos, easy for you to edit the videos and having a format that's simple enough where you can, can execute the videos. Not every video needs to be a, a movie. Uh, you could start off maybe with an unboxing video or uh, just a talking head video. So something that doesn't require massive editing and something that's easy for you to do. So I think it depends on your experience level and your skills too. Like if you're a video editor already, you might be able to make a banger for your first upload. But if you're a beginner, shooting with your phone using iMovie is the way to go. So that's what I would recommend for someone starting off is to make it easy for you and don't, again, I think people just get all up in their head and they, then they never end up making any videos. Yeah, it's a brilliant tip and I want to kick it to uh, Rad to talking about, you mentioned I put one of your older videos on screen. Talk about starting simple and what it was like years ago to get started. And, you know, these days you've leveled up and workflow and editors and team and all this different stuff. But take us back to when you just started. 
Yeah, absolutely. The first couple of videos that we made, I was actually talking to my brother Yanni about it uh, yesterday, and he reminded me that we, we had two videos that took us from maybe under a thousand subscribers up to 17,000 subscribers, and they were both shot on an iPhone with no editing. It was, an, it was shot in one take and then it was just uploaded. And it was shot in a way where we were like, oh man, we've got to do some content on YouTube. You know, let's go and make a video. And Yanni said, yeah, let's do a video on this. And one of the videos was back then my girlfriend, my now wife, he, I filmed him coaching her through a deadlift where we're a gym business, so it's all fitness videos. And he was just coached. The idea was an absolute beginner being coached on how to do a deadlift. And then another one was my brother at the time had an injury called golfer's elbow in here. And he just did a video on what he's been doing for his golfer's elbow video. And those videos together, they went viral for us. And they both got uh, a couple of hundred thousand views, I think, or maybe tens of thousands of views. And yeah, <laughs> I'm pretty sure this is it. This is it. All one take. Um, you know, look at that. We don't even have a tripod. You know, you can see the iPod, uh, the, the the camera moving around like this. And that video, I, I can't even remember how many views it's got, Sean. Maybe you can tell me. But that, but that video and this one other video, which we actually ended up taking down. And it's funny because I don't know if I would do that today. But Yanni made a mistake in the way that he was coaching the technique of the deadlift. And we had all these sticklers coming on going, oh, that's wrong. You shouldn't do it like that. And we were just constantly defending ourselves saying, yeah, you're right. It was this. And we just decided, look, we're going to take it down. But those two videos took us to 17,000 subscribers. And then from there, we started to get a little bit more serious. Um, we bought a tripod. We bought a camera. We were still doing like one take videos, but that's evolved to now, you know, highly polished, highly edited stuff with a team of video editors. Yeah, it's so inspiring. That video has 254,000 views. And <laughs> what Rad is saying, everyone, is that it's one take, meaning it's like press record, record the entire 13 minute video, turn it off at the end, and yep. upload it to YouTube from a smartphone. And so, yep. of course, you might feel like I do want to level up someday or I see the production value of my competitors. But you got to start with what you have. It's not about your resources, it's about your resourcefulness. Which brings us to tip number two, which is set up a place to film. Now we could take this a couple of different directions. You know, Rad's doing some new stuff with some kind of cool vlog style content. You see that Jennifer has a place to film. And so we'll start with Jennifer. And she started, um, she mentioned that she's got like a, a filming space, like a studio. And so what have you found the power maybe over the years of having a place that can be dedicated to creating content and that saving you time and being more productive? Definitely having a dedicated space, de uh, very consistent lighting, that's really important because something that will bog you down is say you're shooting in different locations, you constantly have to change your camera settings, your lighting, your white balance and everything. With this setup here, I've used the same light bulbs. They're all the same color temperature. I've actually been using the same main camera the entire time. I've never changed out. I, I, I've added additional cameras, but I still use the exact same camera. Um, I have an overhead camera as well, so I do live streams too. So I have all of the equipment set up so I, to kind of ease the friction and make it as smooth as possible to shoot, to shoot videos quickly. So in fact, right after I get done with you guys, I'll probably shoot a video. Since I already have my hair done, I have makeup on, so kind of to be more efficient, I'll do that. But yeah, I've had the same camera forever and I haven't, upgraded it because that's the camera that works for me. That's the camera I'm most comfortable with. And I know I can get a result I'm happy with. So it helps if you have a dedicated area and you have everything set up. So you don't have to constantly break down the lights and everything you can, you just have it there. I, in fact, this is actually the living room in my house. We actually don't have a living room. We turn this room just into a filming space. Uh, so inspiring. And I think about that too. You know, I want to encourage our community that, um, like, what's your dream? What's your vision for your channel? What would you love to have someday? And I'm sure all of us would say like, oh, I'd love to have a great, great camera, maybe a whole separate room or a whole basement, or maybe someday we'll move into a bigger house or a bigger apartment. Great, dream big, but be willing to start small and start with what you have. I think about when we started our Clear Vision Media business, we started in the corner of our living room and I just took a corner and that's where we were then. Now I'm grateful that in this particular home office is where we film in Vegas. We have a studio. We actually rent out 
one of our team member, Kyle, uh, has a pretty cool house. And part of it is rented to our company because uh, like a thousand square feet of it could be dedicated to what it is we're filming there. So it's just different seasons. But the dedicated space, what could you do? One of my favorite things are those uh, wardrobe, the privacy shields. You know, how could you partition a particular room? Don't always think, oh, I can't do it because I don't have this. What do you have? You know, using what you have, thinking a little bit different about what you have. And I want to kick it to Rad, thinking about over the years, how have you found that having a dedicated space or studio or place where you create content has been helpful? And, and what really are you up to today in terms of how you're creating content? It's a game changer if it's something that you can actually do. And I'll, I'm going to echo what you just said. Like, don't let it be the thing that stops you from getting started. But as soon as you can, having that dedicated space, it really just gets you in that head space. And when we were at the gym, we went far enough as to create a podcast studio and we had like soundproofing and everything in it. And we used to do live streaming in there and, uh, and film a lot of videos in there. And now that we've sold the gym and I've moved to an online business, we got a, a home where I now have a dedicated studio and you, so this is the background that you're seeing. This is like a separate part of my home. That's my studio there in the background and my house is up the top there. So I do, I have like my own gym set up down under my house here, which is where I just train. And then what you're seeing, my background here was in that little office that was, uh, that was behind me where you were looking there. So yeah, that, that, that's my office there in the background. Um, that's where I am right now. Uh, that's me. That's, so that's the background there. So I'm just sitting at the desk in front of that. So yeah, a, a, a dedicated space is huge. It just gets you in the headspace. It, 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 it means that, you know, when I come down here, I know it's time to work. I've got my workstation. I've got everything set up. And it's, it's been a game changer for me. And it's, it's a gradual process, you know, like you don't look at the, at a workspace like what I've got here and think, oh my God, like I've got to go from there to here in one step. It didn't happen like that for me. You know, the lighting came bit by bit, the posters came bit by bit, the shelves came that, you know, it's a, it's a gradual process, but it's really valuable. I love that tip. Let's go to number three, which is develop your video editing workflow. And so develop your video and editing workflow. So I've been doing, I've been a video for a long time. So workflow is a word that maybe you wouldn't normally hear, but like a workflow is okay. Uh, plug the SD card in the camera, capture it to the SD card. Then the SD card comes out of the camera, is plugged into the computer, footage is captured. Then you actually put it into the timeline, video is edited, then the video is exported. I've um, heard it said there's, you know, four stages of production. There is pre-production, post, there's pre-production, production, post-production, post and distribution. What am I doing before? What am I actually doing when I'm filming? What is post-production be editing? export and then distribution would be like put it on youtube and then remember our rocket r share it everywhere so there's a lot of different approaches to workflow i want to kick it to jennifer because she was talking about this um she talks about a workflow process and so jennifer how has that helped you get more done in less time well admittedly this is one of my goals for this year is getting better with a workflow um i think when you're a solo creator it's really easy to sort of get lost in your your mission and then with the content. So I think it's important to figure out like a system that works for you. Um, so with the editing, with filming, what's, you know, what order should you shoot everything in? Should you shoot eight videos at a time? You know, I shoot a lot of different formats. So I'll do talking head videos. I will do tutorials. I also do live streams and I do, you know, a lot of different types of content. And I, I kind of have this down, but I do think that there there's some things I could do to get better. Uh, one thing I've been looking at, I, I've been looking for um, like these digital planners and I was on Etsy and there are a lot of designers that sell specifically YouTube planners or uh, like workflow sheets or even like content creation um, planners and they're digital or you can print them out. And I was actually thinking about getting that because I think that would help me um, especially with like certain videos, like, you know, like tutorial videos for me can be kind of complicated because I have to shoot all different angles. I've got, there's like a gazillion different steps I have to shoot. I, I sometimes will script those out a little bit and, uh, you know, I have to shoot, uh, record my voiceover. So I do think that every content creator can get better with the workflow. But I think if you can figure out a system that allows you to kind of 
get each video done or, you know, be in the middle of multiple projects at once, I think you're going to be a step ahead. I love that. And I love, man, well, I'm getting pumped because yesterday we were talking about systems. The secret is the system and systems for all of life. Like we've got a one-year-old, a three-year-old right now. We have like a, how do we get the kids to assist, uh, to bed system and really a r routines and in atomic habits. That's what James Clear talks about goals. We don't rise to the level of our goals. We follow to the level of our systems. Systems are the habits. They're the routines. And um, those are that's a great recommendation that to get a checklist. And just as a reminder, you know, inside of our uh, the workbook, we have like our rocket and rank checklist. It's all in there. And when you print this out and maybe put this on your desk inside of VRA, uh, upload your video to YouTube, order captions from rev.com if you want to spend that money, include your reverse engineer title, upload your thumbnail, add your tags, add your description, test uh, all the links in your description. Notice that tip. Don't just get your description optimized, make sure the links work. It's so often so funny when I'll be doing channel reviews or coaching for people. And I'll be like this, you wanted them to go to your website and like book a call with you. You wanted them to actually go check your website link doesn't even work. I did actually just replied to somebody on Twitter. And I was like, your, your link doesn't even work the one you sent me nor the one in your bio test your links your why is affiliate money not coming in? The link doesn't work. So uh, better a short pencil than a long memory. You know, even if you're a pro, you forget things. And so we like to turn everything into checklists and have systems for all the different aspects of YouTube. And so, Rad, I'm curious, what is your workflow for the content that you're creating uh, today, like the system to get the videos done that you're putting out there? Um, good question. I've actually got three styles of videos that I'm working with now, and the one style has has many different, and that is the, you know, the the ranked search video. So of course, there's how tos, there's um, you know, ten tips, there's you know, uh, all, all the all the different techniques that we use. These, these are some very old videos are showing you. This is more <laughs> of the one take, one take wonder. So that's one style that I'm doing. Another style that I'm doing is the ones that you can see there, which is these are my daily vlog videos. So for that one, um, you know, the the only real sort of workflow that I have is that I try to get myself into a headspace that um, I'm very aware that when I do my daily vlog videos, I'm not just filming things for the sake of it that I'm really adding value to people because the way that I work out is very different to the way most fitness influencers work out because I combine strength and flexibility. So I'm always getting myself into a headspace before I start where I'm giving value and I'm not just kind of sitting there going through the motions, you know, with my head down. Um, that's, so that's one style of video that I do. That's one part of my workflow. Another part of my workflow, like if I'm doing a ranked video, I'll really follow the VRA framework. So I'm going to research first and there's multiple ways to research. I'm either going to use um, vidIQ and I'm going to, um, you know, do keyword research and, and things like that. So this is one of uh, our more highly edited videos. Um, and another way that I'll research is because we've been going for a while now and we get a lot of comments on my channel, I'll look at what people are asking and I'll ask answer specific questions. Um, and then another way that I will research is that I will look at what other YouTubers are doing and I will be inspired by them. I don't often copy what other people are doing. I've done that once or twice and I know that's a, a good technique for people. It's just not something that felt right for me. I more like to get inspired by a video editing style that somebody else is doing. And so I'm doing this new video editing style now where it's like I'm doing these transitions that I've only done two videos and this, using this new style, check this out. The second video that I made, I posted the same, it's a reel, I posted the same reel to Instagram. It got 680,000 views in less than a month and it doubled my following on Instagram in less than a month. The second video trying this new style. Um, it's crazy. And then I have, uh, and you can, the, the video, it's a short um, on my channel. If you scroll down a little bit, I can't remember. Uh, it's um, three reasons to practice the horse stance. Uh, you'll see it coming up. Um, and even without the sound, if you watch it, you'll be able to see the editing style um, uh, or, or three, three, three. I'm searching horse. Horses. So I'm going to search horse using yeah, horse there it is, the right technique. Yeah. The right technique. No, no, that's not it. No, it's not it. It's a three reasons to practice the horse. Stand. horse it's literally stand. doubled. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, it's literally doubled my subscribers, uh, my followers on um, Instagram. It took us from 22,000 to 46,000 in less than a month. It's insane. Nothing's wow. ever gone that well. Um, and anyway, are you, and are then, you posting uh, your, so you'll sometimes create reels on Instagram and also post them as YouTube shorts? No, everything I create for YouTube and then I distribute it to other channels. I and I do that because YouTube, like I have an online business and we have a questionnaire for all our new members to fill out. And if you just keep scrolling while I'm looking, I'll be able to point it to you because it's only within, just if you go slow, it's only within the last 20 videos or so. Just keep going slowly. Um, and it, 70% uh, of our new members come from YouTube. 70% of my business comes from my YouTube videos. And that's where we make our money. And the, so then I just, so I focus all my effort on creating content for YouTube. Um, that's it. This is it. So if you watch the editing style here, you'll see it in the first couple of takes. You see how I'm like cutting and doing these transitions that make it look like it's, that's I've got cool. it. Yeah. Yeah. I got inspired to do that by this YouTuber that I saw and I've never, and I, he's got like 3 million subscribers and I'm looking at his content, trying to figure out what's going so well for him. And in all honesty, like I, I don't mean to sound arrogant, but I don't think the context of what he's doing is really, really good. I don't think he's got great information, but his editing style, he does these edits. And if you watch this, watch how the video loops, Sean, you watch this, so watch this last little bit here. Oh, wow. It goes right. As your that? arms it go goes right, right, right back. Yeah, right yeah, back yeah. And then it loops back into the video. And I, and I studied his videos and I was like, this is what it is. It's this style. And I made two of these videos and the second one. So it's, it's you know, it's done 5,000 views on YouTube. But every one of my viral videos on YouTube, it didn't go viral until a year or two later. So let's see what happens in the year. But that same video. Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah. So that's, that's, that's my process for uh, getting ready to film and for editing. Um, my vlog videos, I'm literally just trimming. I'm just doing chronological editing. I don't do any editing to it. Like it's like the Sam Sulek style. I, I just chronologically edit and trim the clips. But for everything else, I've got a, a video editor over um, that works for me full time. Wow, that's super inspiring. And I took out some major nuggets. You know, one of the things I've learned about YouTube Shorts as well is that um, we have posted some in 180 days later, 222 days later, they'll start picking up. Uh, but yeah, if you have a vertical video, you have an asset that you can post on multiple platforms. Now, we we encourage people to be cautious because even as Rad's talking, like he's got a business, he's got money coming in, he's got people helping him. And so being on every single social media platform can be a little bit of a distraction and even a hindrance when you're just starting out. Um, but also 70% of his business is coming from YouTube. YouTube really is, the CMO of HubSpot said it this way. They said that YouTube subscribers are the most valuable subscribers on the internet. And another big takeaway, Rad, was um, that you just start with YouTube first, because that's a good point. Like if your YouTube short only gets 5,000 views, but you upload it as an Instagram reel and it gets 600,000 or goes viral, like you still, same difference ultimately, but then YouTube might pop off three months later, Instagram might get the views this week, but they stop. And so as you have a system, the secret is the system, systems, thinking about your workflow, as you've got systems supporting you, then you can start really getting better results, which brings us to number four, and we'll kick it back to Jen. And she was talking about utilizing both really high production content and low production content. Not every video has to be the highest level of quality and you can rotate between these formats. Jen, break this down of like how you would define these terms and what this would mean for you. Yeah, well for me, like say low production, that would be something like a talking head video where you're just maybe talking about a community topic, something like that. High production would be like an in-depth sewing tutorial, something with tons of different B-roll, lots of different shots so that would be a higher production video or again mr beast videos would be high production super high production but the average person can't make a mr beast video every week or even every month so i would definitely recommend if you if you want to try to upload consistently try to maybe rotate between you know maybe shoot a few low production videos you can batch shoot those but then also shoot for something a little more impressive Again, I think that will help, but also if you kind of mix it up, people will get like a sense of a variety for the video style and it'll make it easier for you. But also, you you know, you won't just be a channel that's doing, say, talking head videos. Another one you can do that's fairly easy. I have an overhead rig 
And sometimes I'll shoot like little unboxing videos or something where I'm featuring something, but it's a faceless video. So I don't have to be on camera. It's something I can shoot anytime. And that I'll do super minimal editing. So like I have another channel where I've been doing like handbag stuff. Um, so I will maybe show what fits inside this particular handbag or something like that. That's something I can shoot. It takes me maybe less than 15 minutes to shoot. It takes maybe, you know, an hour or two to edit and do everything. But it's something that's very simple. And you can kind of mix in those formats just to give a little more variety to the content, but also make it feasible for you. Because again, you can't be doing a Mr. Beast level video every, every week. It's just not, even for me, again, I don't even have an editor. So I do all the editing myself. And sometimes you can get bogged down in the editing. The other thing I would say is do a format that's, easy for you to edit. So there are certain video styles, like I, I find editing vlogs is actually fairly easy for me. So that would be one where if I want, and I probably should do more of that type of content. For some reason, that's almost easier for me than editing a talking head video with a lot of background B-roll and graphics and stuff. But the vlog would actually look cooler. So as you're experimenting with the editing, figure out which style is the most fun, you know, maybe like the one you enjoy the most and the one that's kind of easy for you. And you can gravitate towards that style. Such a great tip there. And uh, I'm going to move us to tip number five and then we'll uh, roll right into six. And because this kind of is an extension, take advantage of scripted versus unscripted content. And so um, what do I mean? In some cases, you may write out your entire script or really outline the video. And in other cases, you might go a little bit more off the cuff. It's kind of same kind of idea is low production versus high production. Sometimes you, you get a video out and you're like, I like to use a, a, this is a tip, you can write it down, a scoring system. Now you just kind of are self-aware, like a 10 out of 10 effort video for you might be like, I, I traveled, I filmed, there's B-roll, there's editing, I really structured all the content. That's like a 10 level of effort. And then there's a one level of effort. My first video that I posted, the, they could not have been <laughs> a lower, worse level of effort. All right, so uh, this is, I guess, the first Sean Thinks vlog and... Uh literally a one like I, even then like for me it i was already doing video product that was a one level of effort so probably i would avoid that but you know unscripted and so i like to think of a scoring system and think about okay i want to upload at least a seven or maybe a six and sometimes we are so overly critical of our content what's funny is the low production or the unscripted video might get tons of views and the high production video might get less. Remember, it's way more about the value to the viewer than it actually is about the production quality. So just a couple tips is that uh, you can jump between these. You could have lower production quality, uh, but it doesn't mean there's lower value. People can still get a, the values in the viewer's mind. Like, oh, wow, I learned something. I got to connect with you. And then maybe sometimes script or maybe... Um, uh, and 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 I remember Jennifer. I'll bring her back. You're talking about how you don't love using a teleprompter. You don't really use a teleprompter. And neither do I. But I also know there's been times when I've outlined a video meticulously, especially when working with a brand, for like six hours. I've worked on like outlining and structuring it. And what am I going to say? And then there's been times where I have like three bullets, and I'll just share those as well. And so you mentioned that in your notes about kind of like what does it mean to script content it doesn't necessarily mean reading it word for word what does that look like for yeah. you um i normally don't script out a lot of videos sometimes i will do scripts if i'm doing a tutorial and but i'll do i'll shoot the on-camera parts and i don't script those but then i will script out like the actual tutorial part but i'm not on camera and this is sort of the more heavily edited part uh, so that's really the only time I do scripting. I'm not great at it. I'm better at just maybe coming up with some bullet points, having a few notes, but I like talking off the cuff. I will also say this as a former television producer, I think the skill of being able to speak extemporaneously is very important. I think it's a huge advantage to you as an on-camera personality. And yeah, I don't, I'm not a huge fan of teleprompters and I will tell you why, Sean. It's because one, I think there's, for me, if I had to use a teleprompter, me having to t script everything out and then set up the teleprompter, use the teleprompter 
it wouldn't save me any time because, you know, I'd have to do all of that stuff. I did work with a client and she was like obsessed with scripting things out. And I almost felt like that hindered her as an on-camera personality because she started using like the scripts as like a crutch. Like, and she couldn't speak if she, you know, like she couldn't do, she had trouble doing like live streams. She had trouble doing guest appearances on other shows because she got so, she relied on the script so much. And I see that a lot with people who use teleprompters as well. I worked in news for a long time and there were anchors that literally couldn't do their job if they didn't have a teleprompter. And there are a lot of situations where they didn't have scripts and they didn't have a teleprompter and they choked. So I've seen that happen in real time and it's, it's kind of comical, but it's also kind of a tragedy as well. Um, and the thing with the teleprompter, I'll also say, is that um, unfortunately, most people think they're great at reading the prompter, but it looks like they're reading a prompter. So I don't think most I don't think most people are skilled enough at using the teleprompter and making it look natural. So I know a lot of people, especially business professionals who do a YouTube channel, they'll be like, oh, we need a teleprompter. I need to have everything scripted out. That might not be the best approach. Um, I think there are very few people that are their best with scripts and with a teleprompter. And I can see where that can almost be a handicap instead of a help. Such great tip. So don't don't come for me, teleprompter people. <laughs> and, and, you know, at the end of the day, and I see there's a lot of good conversation happening uh, in the chat is, uh, you know, you got to find what works for you and those and, and take the tips and the nuggets of wisdom that are being shared here, like, Sure, use a teleprompter, but like work on the skill of making it natural uh, over time. Learn how to speak extemporaneously. And so you can kind of flow. That takes time to build the skill, but build that skill up. There's so many nuggets that we can all apply, but you got to then find out your personalized workflow and your personalized system. So I want to kick it to Rad and, and Jennifer hit this a little bit earlier. Tip number six is batch produce content when possible. And batch production is where you would shoot more than one video at one time. Uh, Jennifer wisely said too, she's like, I, I got ready for today's stream. And so as soon as she's uh, off of this, then she can make some more videos. She was able to connect with like the 934 people here live. And if you're watching on the replay, thanks for being here, you know, and then also make more content because you're already set up, you're already in the flow. So I'm curious, Rad, like um, I know today, like right now you're doing these are they daily? Are you kind of doing daily videos or a couple a week? I'm doing two a day. Okay. <laughs> two, so now two, you're two long form videos every day. Um, so I, but batch producing like pre produced videos, absolutely, 100%. So yeah, the reason I do. Time. Let's go back in history. Tell us about a time when maybe like walk us through one of your shoot days that yeah. you had so, a couple of videos planned out and then how you got them all done in one day. Yeah, so we would when we were back in the gym and we would have to set everything up, you know, because obviously as as a gym I didn't have lights and everything just set up there. We were we were a functioning gym, so we'd have to come out and set everything up. So we'd we'd do our research, we'd we'd research the video that we were going to create. We'd come up with a the a concept, the big idea first, and then once you've got that big idea, you start looking into your titles and your thumbnails and you get the feel for what you're going to do for the video. And then some videos, the I'm, I'm just trying to think back in the day, how I don't think we scripted much at all back then. The only thing that we used to really script was the the intro that we did. And it wasn't scripted as though it was written down. It was that was back in the day where it was like, uh, hi, everybody, my name's Rad from Unity Gym. And if you want to learn the best tips for this, like it was just this generic intro, which I which I don't do now and I've learned is not best practice. But um, so what we would do is we'd, we'd have our concept and, and, and we'd, we'd have our two or three videos that we were going to do. And then when you go out and you set up, you know, you've got this one video that you're going to do, you, you, you get it all done, you do all your different shots and then you say, yep, that video is done. Okay, what's our next video? And it just makes that like within one to two hours of filming, you can actually produce several assets and it actually reduces a lot of the amount of stress because if you have a goal to do one video a week, you know, you could like, a, I think a really smart way to do it would be to try and film four videos at once. And that might take you a couple of hours to do, but then you've got this content that you can just edit 
and you've got a, a whole month's worth of content to do and you can and then you can do like an editing day or uh, an editing couple of days whatever your process is and then schedule those videos one a week for four weeks and then you get that freedom to move on to okay what are my next couple of videos that i'm going to do which is a very different cadence to every week kind of feeling that pressure of oh i need to do a new video now oh it's friday and i'm meant to post on sunday uh, so i think that's a really smart way to do it such powerful tips what has been your favorite tip so far uh challenge uh we'll recap them and we've got start simple number one number two set up a place to film number three develop your video and editing workflow number four utilize low production and high production content number number five uh take advantage of scripted versus unscripted content and then number six batch produce content when possible what have been some of your aha moments so far Number seven is tap into the power of live streaming. We'll start with Jen. And uh, she's made an interesting pivot lately, which is kind of an insight um, in terms of how live streaming affected her channel, but she still loves doing it. You built a studio. How have you found when it comes to getting the video out there, the power of live streaming to help? Yeah, so I had done a consultation with a former YouTube employee last year. And I noticed that my channel had been kind of taking a hit. And the advice I got from this guy was, was awesome. He said, I was doing kind of too many different formats on the channel and it wasn't connecting with this, the, like they were two different audiences. So I was doing things like sewing tutorials or like, you know, overviews on sewing machines. But then I was also doing live streams on like community topics, like, the sewing and quilting community is big on like things that are going on, like uh, different controver there, there are controversies in sewing, believe it or not. Right now, everyone's talking about what's going on with uh, Joanne Fabrics. So he said, you either need to do no live streaming or like just do all live streaming. Because my other thought, I was like, well, maybe I can do a live streams where it's like so it's like a sew and chill. Like I have different camera setups and maybe I could do sort of like sew with me, kind of like a voyeuristic kind of thing. So I had that thought. So he said to, and I know I don't really recommend doing two different channels, uh, but I decided to start a, li a channel just for live streaming. So I started Sewing Report Live um, probably about one year ago. And at first I was having trouble figuring out what kind of content was, was going to hit. So at first I was doing these like, so with me type things like so I would make an entire project and have different camera angles and it looked very cool but they were very hard to do these were very long live streams like they were eight hours long and they weren't really performing that well so I started trying to do different live streams and what I found ended up is working the best right now is covering kind of sewing news so again it's called the sewing reports so I guess I probably should have done this a long time ago, but I'll find out what's going on in the sewing community. Uh, like again, the financial picture of Joanne Fabrics right now is kind of the thing to talk about. Yeah, so I did a whole oh, yeah, uh, fifty yeah. thousand views. I know. I was like, holy crap, you know. <laughs> So I ended up looking into the background of Joanne Fabrics CEO and it's like very, very sketchy. So I found all of these like and again, I think this also kind of lends itself to my background as a news producer. So it was something I could do. It was very easy for me to do all the research. So what I, I've been doing is doing live streams. And again, these are not, you know, using StreamYard software. There's really not a lot of editing. I do some prep work, but it's easier than me spending three days editing a tutorial video. So these for me were kind of easy to do. I've been doing them about once a week. And if I do different topics, what I've been doing is I do the live stream and it's the, it's been sort of catching on. It takes a while for people to realize you do regular shows. Then after the show is over, I'll cut up clips from the live stream. And those have actually been performing better than the lives themselves. And it's super easy to do. And you're giving people more of a viewing option. This is a very popular format for podcasts. They do the podcast and they cut the clips or they might have a clips channel. And then they'll also cut short video, short verticals for YouTube shorts, Instagram reels, you know, TikTok. And this is a good way for you to get a lot of content out of one raw piece of video. So I start off with a live stream, then I cut the clips. Really the only work for the clips is doing the, the thumbnails is the longest part. So that's really the thing that takes the most time. And then uh, the, like the Joanne, anything with Joanne Fabrics for the most part, I don't know why, but that's like the thing. 
Um, so this is kind of a, so this live channel is more for what's happening in the sewing community. And then the main channel, I'm I've been just sticking to strictly sewing and quilting related content. And it's kind of made I like the separation, but it's crazy because current right now, like literally right now, the live channel with 4000 subscribers is getting more views in real time than the main channel. So for all of you out there thinking you have to have a lot of subscribers or a big audience already, I'm actually getting better performance on that newer channel with 4,000 subs than the one with like 113. So, and I also think this is helping, like, I don't know, I, I've seen some info from like that YouTube liaison guy, Renee, on Twitter that sometimes you can kind of like cannibalize your own videos. So I almost feel like by having two different channels, but in the same niche, that's maybe helping my stuff get out there more. I don't know, just a theory, but I've just, I've just noticed a lot more traction with the live channel recently than the main channel. So I don't know. That's no, that's a good, I mean, there's so many nuggets there and super powerful. You know, one of the things I'm sure a question's coming up is like, wait a minute, will live streaming hurt my channel? Um, I, what Jennifer discovered is that it could and also that she had an older channel over a hundred thousand subscribers and that that particular format like wasn't ultimately helping that launch this new channel which is crushing so but like i can report that live streams can do really great for us our coffee with candle show on the podcast channel live streams on um i think media as well and so um you this is why the sixth r in our system is review what gets measured gets improved. You got to be studying analytics, looking at the results, looking at how things are um, performing on your channel, and then being willing to pivot. And it's so inspiring to hear that not only can Jennifer have her original channel, but also launch something new with all the wisdom she has and like have two things working. And so you definitely want to have that personalization for figuring out what's working for you. But what great news, and we reported this yesterday, that we're seeing a lot of small and new channels also being recommended on all kinds of people's homepages. Not just my opinion, across the board, this is happening. It, like YouTube is giving impressions, which means YouTube is giving opportunity to brand new creators in 2024. It was Mr. Beast that said, YouTube is the most generous platform and it's the best algorithm. And as soon as you, as you figure out how to make content and figure out what content format works best for you, it's a really good time to get started and a really good time to get discovered. And a new channel can give you an advantage because sometimes the, having subscribers over years, maybe they're not paying as much attention. Maybe you've mixed your audience a little bit. You've done different content formats that have just created a lot of different people. And that could sometimes create some algorithmic confusion. So having fresh vision, a clear strategy, knowing your niche, knowing your, your strategy and dialing that in on a new channel might just very be and an advantage. Rad, I want to ask you about the power of live streaming. It seems like it's not maybe one of your main things, but you do this as well. So um, what have you learned when it comes to this? Uh, interesting that you say that. So I don't do live streaming right now, but when we went through one of our biggest growth spurts was during COVID uh, in 2020. And uh, God, it seems like such a weird thing to talk about now, doesn't it? It's like that that weird time back in the past. But 2020, March, went into lockdown. We were forced to close our gym. Yeah, here you go. And we just immediately pivoted to doing live streaming. Wow. <clears throat> Fortunately for us, when this happened, we were positioned really well because we had our uh, SLR camera. So we, we had our D DSLR. Um, we had a Sony 6100. Uh, we had a set up you know we had decent internet and everything and so we literally we closed the gym and we said all right tomorrow we're doing live streaming workouts and i was the model my brother we set up these microphones so that my brother was sitting behind the camera with one of our trainers and they had microphones and so they were talking and we bought you can see i'm wearing like one of those aerobics microphones where um you know the aerobics instructors wear and we started doing these daily live streaming workouts and we were getting on the live stream, we were getting maybe between 50 and 80 concurrent viewers. And that was back when our channel had probably about, I think we had 17,000 or 20,000 viewers back then, about our uh, subscribers back then about, and we went from that to 40,000 
within those 12 weeks that Australia was in lockdown um, in, in 2020. So that was, a, that was a huge thing for us. And then what we also did um, for a period of time there, we used to do live streaming daily within our podcast studio and you'd be able to see those if you look on our um, old live streams as well where we we built a, a like a, we were inspired by joe rogan and we built a podcast studio and we used to go on live daily we had a friend of ours who's a sports physiotherapist and my brother and i and we used to basically just answer people's questions about you know what they wanted to know and that builds a really really strong community um so this is actually a little bit later sean if you go back to maybe a year before that because this is this is when we just sold the gym and we were now doing our daily live streaming from our homes and we were using um uh, i can't remember what that v vmix um so those are the early days of the studio anyway and we did um yeah, we were doing these daily live streamings and we, we built a really solid community from that. People people really enjoyed it. We got a lot of business from that. People would like tune in for a while and then they'd be like, you know, I'm all in on this. I want to join your subscription. And So yeah, it's very powerful. Man, I love that. And I do want to encourage our community right now. Take notes. I know you're taking notes, but like capture the ideas, dream big, make your plan. But here's what we're not saying. We are not saying you have to do every single tip in this video all at once. In fact, that would be absolutely an, an a recipe for overwhelm. But YouTube is a journey. And again, we sometimes overestimate how much we can accomplish in the next one year, but we underestimate how much we can accomplish in the next five years. And so you don't have to start live streaming right now. I know a lot of us, I'm not, I, that would be terrifying. I'm not ready yet. Yeah, get ready, meaning do other kinds of content. But set a vision as your skills grow, as you experiment in the future. But man, what Rad said right there that I think we all really need to be prepared for is uh, Samantha said in the chat, Rad was prepared back when those lockdowns happened. You know, I think that we all can remember the pandemic and we saw what happened to restaurants and gyms and different things and businesses and, and it was so disruptive. But you know who grew the most during that time was people who were online, was people in the creator economy, because all of a sudden now all this attention shifted. And so there's something about getting ready right now. What's going to happen in 2024? We don't know. What's going to happen over the future? We're, we're not sure. But why not get yourself positioned, start building your personal brand, start learning these skill sets, and having an agility mindset that you're ready to pivot, that you're ready to do things. And having an open mindset that also that was a season and now there's a different season now but if need be rad could always go back to that jennifer's ready notice how these two creators i'm so inspired are innovating they're agile they're continuing to learn they're paying attention to what's happening they're continuing to have different seasons of content creation unfortunate thing about youtube is we cannot give you like this is the one way it's going to work and you can bank on that master this and it's going to work forever. That's also why our community is a living, breathing community. That's why we re-record and update video ranking Academy because it's a, uh, there's always going to be changes, but if you have the right mindset and you stay agile and adapt and pivot, stay connected to a powerful community and continue commit to learning and leveling up your skills. Then ultimately number eight, uh, is our, our tip here to get smarter, to use systems and to speed up over time, to continue to add to your uh, tool set of skills. I want to pass it to Jen here on this idea of, again, over the years, you started one way, but now you've got all this wisdom and people are like, you know, drop like, wow, this is a good session. Like, you can't take notes fast enough. And so thank you both for adding so much value. What's well, not your mindset, Jen, when it comes to being a, a YouTube Oh, gee, right now. I mean, 2016, 17, eight years on the platform. Um, what is kind of the mindset do you think is necessary to have success related to tip number eight here? Hmm. That's a that's a really good question. I think trying to get obviously get better at what you do um, and find ways, find ways to improve the videos and to improve the consistency and keep evolving. Um, like you were saying, find systems. I try to find as many tools to make this content creation easier. Uh, so for instance, a couple of things, you know, I've done, I found, um, there's, I use Adobe Premiere and I found a few plugins. I found a plugin for Premiere that it's like an AI tool. There are a few of these and I, I'm not going to say the one I use cause I don't, I don't really recommend it. It's okay, but I'm, you know, I'm not, 
I wouldn't say I'm like a super, th I'm super thrilled because they keep updating the tool and it keeps getting like worse. But I found this tool that will take your clips and it will cut out all of the dead space and silence. So for me, that was huge. And I, I do all of my own editing. I, I personally have not, I think a lot of my videos would be very difficult to hand off to an editor that didn't know anything about sewing. Uh, I've tried some Fiverr editors for like my other channel for very low stakes videos only. And it was okay, but honestly, I could have done it faster. My Like by the time you type out the instructions to the editor, look it over, I I, I didn't feel like it was worthwhile. Plus I, I used to work with a video client. I no longer do, so I had more time to edit myself. So I kind of stopped doing that. So that's why I don't use an editor. But since I found like the AI tool, like there are a few, that saves me probably a good hour or two hours because I'm not really having to do the rough cut. The tool is not perfect and you do have to, you know, make some tweaks, but it can at least get you like 80% of the way there so that you're not having to sit through. And I do edit pretty, I'm pretty vicious with the editing, with cutting out the dead space, cutting out all my ums. And another good thing, because I'm unscripted, that's the thing, you can cut anything out. So like, if you feel like you're too rambly or I'm like, wow, I said, yeah, you know, too many times or uh, you can just cut it. So with the AI tool like that, it makes it really easy for you to be very um, cutthroat with the editing. And then I've also found some other tools like um, I have a Logitech MX Master 3 mouse. I think there's a newer generation. And then I have this Logitech keyboard but they were both programmable. So they integrate with Premiere and you can actually create custom editing macros. So I figured out like which buttons and which um, which functions I wanted set to different keys. And that also makes editing a lot quicker for me because I don't have to do that. When I'm setting up my editing timeline, I have kind of a basic template and I keep all of my elements like my graphics frequently used, my sound effects that I use the most. I kind of keep that all together and then I just copy and paste that from one timeline to another. So you can do that. Again, when I'm doing the thumbnails, I also use Canva Pro. I used to use Photoshop, but Canva Pro came out with some tools that are better. So I found like, especially with the background removal in Canva Pro, it's way faster than I was doing in Photoshop. I was like, screw this. So Canva Pro finally came out with enough tools where I felt it was worth paying for. I use the same font in most of my thumbnails, so I don't have to think about it. Use a lot of the same styles. So kind of simplifying that process helped me to be able to do things faster. I I'm, Obviously, I use all of the default upload settings on YouTube, so I don't have to do that all over again. So I've just figured out over the years things that make things easier for me. Again, I have all my cameras set up to be uh, match to the light, light color, temperature, whatever. I'm not like, and I'm not even super tech savvy. So like, this is something anybody can figure out. But just little things that kind of made eliminated frustrations and eliminated tasks. I'll try to do that. Yeah, that's so powerful. And you got really tactical there, which- I know, I'm a nerd. I'm us, a total nerd. Half of us are loving and then some are like, oh my gosh, it's so much. And I want to encourage- Again, we remember start simple and then level up as you go. Now, I, I will let me see if you. I'll throw out a couple there because people are like, "What's the tool?" Yeah. You know, uh, one of the tools okay, for Premiere uh, is uh, we use uh, we've used AutoPod. Okay, I've used and, that too. I didn't like I didn't like it, so yeah. I was like, okay. And so what? Will, 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 what's the tool? It's it's AutoCut. Um, but what I don't here's what I don't like. I'm I had some issues so. It was getting really funky. So like when it first came out, I was using it and I was like, this is great. But every time they did an update, things like they would mess it up. So it got, what I do like about it though, is I don't really do podcasting with guests. So I didn't need AutoPod. Um, but with AutoCut, you can do, so I shoot a lot of two camera videos and it works with two cameras. So that's what I liked about it. But I feel like the tool has gotten worse over time. And they've also like really changed, like at first they, they keep, they keep coming out with different tiers of the paywall. I'm very confused. I don't know if I would renew it. Sure. I'm not. And when I tried to contact the company, they're on Twitter, so you can reach out to them. And I'm like, hey, this is really messed up. Because one time I used it and it was like, not even remote. Like it was like, it was not like, it was like really weird. 
So I contacted the company and I was like, hey, I'm experiences. And they wanted me to do like, they're like, hey, can you send us all of your files? I'm like, no, I'm not sending you all of my files. It, I was like, so they were kind of asking me to do all their troubleshooting. I felt like that was weird to ask the customer in their credit. They did refund all of my money. So they're like, yeah, we'll just give you a refund. So I have it for a year, I guess, for free. But I swear, every time they, they keep making these changes that make the tool worse and then adding huh. on all of these other features that are like... So a lot of the features that were with the original version are now with like the premium version. It's just really confusing. And I don't I don't like it as a customer. So that's why I'm not really I'm not thrilled with recommending this company, but I do use it. I, love I just it. I, I'm hoping to find something better. I had to put I had to put it uh, out there because I know people are curious and I was curious yeah. as well. But uh, a couple things <laughs> for our community. One, we'll, we'll be uh, putting in the circle group. Uh, a summary of some of the resources mentioned here. Number two, um, one of the tools that you, you just hear so many people and I see people in the chat recommending is Canva. And I think it's 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 for most of us, some of these people said Canva killed Photoshop just because it keeps getting better. And so if you wanna check that out, uh, you can use our affiliate link at Design With Think to get a free pro trial. We love uh, Canva. And then this is, uh, by the way, friends, why we have our AI for YouTube guide is one of the bonuses you can see that on the right side is this, I think two big things, one, that's a living document because exactly what Jen said is what we're experiencing. There's some good tools. We plug them in. They help us a little bit, but the roadmap of these software companies sometimes has them get a little bit weaker and there's a better option. I know that can sound frustrating, but it's just the nature of the evolution of Premiere's evolving. These softwares are evolving. So just that document alone is why it's a living document that we're giving to everybody because we are constantly testing and doing a lot of the painstaking research to save you time and time is money. So that's so valuable to have that. And the other thing is in our group and with just our faculty in general at Think Media, um, what we're more, most passionate about is helping you find the best tools for you. Because as you see how deep the rabbit hole can go, getting into all of these la layers of complexity can slow you down. So sometimes it's what is the simplest way to get started. And so there's like la layers to what tools to use. That's why, for example, Canva, you saw me make a thumbnail in two minutes, it's kind of a no brainer. As you get into editing, you probably have a million questions about editing. We're here to help. And so that's a lot of what happened. Like it's, we have access, we answer your questions in our community, we debate the different tools. It's kind of just the, an aspect of the, creator business of the YouTube business is just kind of being willing to pace yourself, but continue to learn and being willing to be open-minded to sometimes pivot. Cause you could be one tool away from saving one, three, five hours a week at, uh, for the different steps that happen within, uh, kind of our content creation workflow. So, okay, we got to go to rad. Uh, uh, so grateful. I want to let you guys go soon. We're landing the plane, but this is a really cool conversation that we had off camera. He already touched on this. But number nine is rank search-based videos, but also create the videos you want to make. I want to encourage you, you know, sometimes people are saying like, well, the way that you're talking about answer specific questions and, and search-based content and learning how to rank videos makes me feel like you're kind of putting us in a box. Like there's other things I want to create as well. And, and this is our entire message. And you'll learn that inside of Video Ranking Academy. We're not saying do just one or the other. We are saying do both especially when you're starting learning how to rank search-based content and having videos that are two years old, still getting you views is invaluable. In fact, after rad, we could talk about Jennifer about some of her videos that have earned like thousands of dollars in affiliate marketing from specific products that she's ranked doing reviews. So those become a very valuable tool, but also when you fast forward to today, there's some new things that are happening and rad even he's doing both and he's got kind of a new approach. So rad really break this down. Cause this is a 2024 conversation that's really happening right now. What is kind of your approach on number nine? Yeah, look, I think I've seen a lot of videos lately where people are talking about how YouTube is changing and the ranked videos are like YouTube's just such an incredible platform where you make this video and you forget about it from two years ago. And then all of a sudden, it's just getting these views. Like you, I'm responding to all these comments and I'm like, what video is that from? And I have to go back and watch the video. I'm like, oh yeah, that's right, I made that video. And these videos just start getting tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of views, which is incredible. But 
I held myself back for many, many years of making the videos that I wanted to make because they really had nothing to do with ranking or searching or using the tips and tools that uh, that you know I've, I followed to get the the incredible growth that we had on YouTube with VRA. And so I'm taking a different approach this year and I'm not forgetting about those styles of videos at all. But last year, my whole goal was to make one video a day, not long form, but it was a, a, a shorts video a day and one long form a week. And I, I achieved that goal. And all of those videos are videos that have the potential to rank high in search and they're an evergreen video. But now this year, what I'm doing is because I've seen this as a trend, especially with this guy, Sam Sulek, who funnily enough is in my niche. He's a fitness uh, influencer and he's just exploded. Like I think he got a million subscribers in six months. Uh, he's up to like almost 3 million now in less than a year and a half. And I've watched enough videos where people are analyzing what it is about what he does. And th there are several things to it, but one of the one of the key things which really stood out to me is he's just doing what he loves. And you can see, like, look at this. His videos start like this all the time. It's just him in the car talking. Like, in all honesty, they couldn't be more boring videos. They couldn't be more videos that break the mold more. But my analysis of this, Sean, is that I think there's a real trend moving towards people um, watching YouTube on smart TVs. And I've heard you talk about that before as well. And on smart TV, it's a really different viewing habit because you have to type in with your remote and it's really awkward. And you don't want to type in, search for something, find it, and then put your remote down and you watch a five minute video while you're eating dinner. And then you got to pick it up and search for something else again. So there's this new opportunity. Well, this is my interpretation of it. I think there's this new opportunity for content that is not so you know, following the, you know, here's the hook and here's the promise and there's fast editing and it's every two seconds. It's more something where you can just sit back on your TV couch and watch and maybe even have it on in the background, you know. And so I've adopted that because I thought to myself, you know what, I do these workouts every day. I do it already anyway. Why don't I just film it and start putting it up? And I'm really enjoying it. I'm getting so much repurposed content by creating shorts out of it. And I, as I said before, I do have a video editor that edits for me. Uh, and so I just make my long form video and then I edit it chronologically and upload it and, and I upload it for him and then he turns it into all these shorts that go up as well. So I'm just getting so much content out of it. It's a lot of fun and it's giving me the freedom now to not feel the pressure to come up with ideas for ranked videos because now what I can do instead of thinking, oh, oh my God, I've got to get a video up this week. What am I going to do and start researching? Now I'm, I'm doing so much content anyway, and I can just think, oh, you know what? I've got this idea for this video. Let's make it. And I, and I can make it with the freedom to have the time. So I know that that might scare a lot of people off thinking, oh my God, Rad's doing two videos a day. Like how would anybody ever be able to do that? But just remember, we've talked about my 10 year journey with YouTube and, you know, something that I didn't say before about the when I went live streaming, when, when we did live streaming, so I had an online business, I had a gym business, the online business was like a side hustle. It was like this, well, we may as well do it. There's this opportunity kind of a thing. And the gym business was where we made our money. COVID hit, we pivoted, we started doing live streaming within a month or two, our online business had 5 x and it was making double what our gym business was making before COVID. And then the gym business never recovered from COVID because where we were in North Sydney, um, the, it just the lockdowns and people started doing work from home and everything. And so we sold the gym and now I run an online business. So now I have this life where my life is making videos on YouTube. And that never would have happened if I hadn't have gone through all these stages that we've talked about on this show where um, it's – you just see the opportunity that works for you. And and right now the opportunity that works for me is to do these these daily uh, uh, workout vlogs. That's, that's an opportunity that I've got that I look at and I see in front of me and I think, you know what, this is fun for me. So I'm going to pursue this. I'm going to give this a little, a little run. Man, such rich tips there. And uh, I hope you're feeling that freedom too, that having the balance between like the strategic, surgical, tactical content that can bring you uh, views for years and drive business results. As we talk, we'll be talking about on session number five. So don't miss the next session on the challenge about uh, the monetization strategies. And if you're getting views from a two-year-old video, that's still leading to one of your monetization strategies. That's true passive income, but also to not feel constrained that there's the opportunity to experiment, to try new things, and to look at where the trends are 
going on YouTube. And so uh, that was uh, number nine, ranked search-based videos, but also create videos you wanna make. And someone was asking about how to rank videos. By the way, that's, that's literally why we created Video Ranking Academy. But as a reminder of a cool tool that we use called uh, vidIQ, you know, when we look at um, Unity Gym here, Rad's channel, if you click these three dots, uh, you have to install vidIQ to see this, but you can go to somebody else's channel and you say view trending videos. This is my dream page because I also love leverage. Like what Rad's doing right now, I don't want to do right now. I'm not doing two videos a day. Uh, I'm actually looking forward to maybe some systems and some things in the future. But right now, I'm just trying to stay sane. One-year-old, three-year-old, life's crazy out here. Uh, but when we look at the seven-month-old video here, this five-year-old video, and this seven-month-old video that Rad has, 8.7 VPH, if you haven't captured that note yet, you want to write that down, views per hour. Not from a video this week, but still getting 8.7 views every single hour from a seven-month-old video. Remember, Christina from Beloved Women was talking about, man, I can go on vacation. I can take time off. I can stop posting. And I'm still not just getting views, but driving results for my online business. And if we look at Jennifer's channel, the same is true. And we go to Sewing Report. She's got older videos um, that are still getting views, and that is what a ranked video is. And so we look at a two-year-old video that gets 3.6 views per hour. Um, we look at a four-year-old video that gets 2.2 views an hour. And a lot of people that I see, I get concerned if I click this on your page and I go to view trending videos and there's nothing there. Now, if you're just starting, of course, it takes time to build up. But um, you become unstoppable when I'm like, man, I haven't yeah, uploaded in a while, but like, boom, I got this trending videos page and I have multiple videos that are being viewed every single hour that are months old and years old. And okay, rapid fire. I, I got to let y'all go, but I want to really quickly here before tip number 10, just the one story, Jen, from, uh, I think a brother sewing machine mm -hmm. and, and these videos of like PE 800 embroidery machine i know right who would have thought i'm like people are that into embroidery okay yeah so this i mean 546,000 views 443,000 views six years old and four years old and you did a strategy we're going to be unpacking tomorrow called affiliate marketing but what were the results like from like creating videos like that was it like an amazon link and then like did good money come in from doing oh those? um so i kind of it's been a while since i anal since i sort of analyzed those videos but I started to, I got that, I, I saw that there were, uh, there was a new, the P800 at the time was new and I looked. So Brother, they make great products. They're very entry level, but they don't have a lot of video support. So I noticed that this company had no videos on how to use the machine. So again, I invested it. It was fairly expensive. It was about $650 to buy the machine. I did an unboxing video and then I did a very comprehensive video on how to use it. So this was this would be a high effort video for me. It included, you can see a lot of different camera shots. I did script this out because um, the sewing people, they'll jump all over you if you get anything wrong. So I ha had to make sure that I had all my information right. And you know, I really looked through the manual and I made a, you know, did a video on just basically how to use it. Cause a lot of people, especially during COVID, they got into embroidery and I didn't realize this, but a lot of younger people are looking into starting an embroidery business, like kind of a small thing. And, you know, they were looking at this particular machine. So I think that video got over 300,000 views. So I made some pretty decent um, affiliate money. And I will say this, the sewing machine, video in general, anything with sewing machines has a very high CPM. Like we're talking over $30 and an RPM of like 15 to $20. So that's actually a very good type of video. And I've, I'm sure you can probably find examples in other niches, like for tech or anything else. There's going to be certain types of videos that have a much higher CPM than normal. Like my normal CPM is probably like $15, 10 to $15. That one is like over 30, 30, $35. So I made several thousand dollars from that video. And then I had linked, linked to, to Amazon. And in fact, I'm doing this with this machine currently. I, I definitely paid for the machine with all of the ad revenue. And I probably made 
I, I tried to keep track. It's kind of hard with Amazon, but I definitely made thousands and thousands of dollars from from affiliate revenue. The, obviously, the Amazon program, they've kind of they've definitely kind of uh, reduced their commission rate. So at the time, I think you could make like eight to 10 percent on a machine. Also, during COVID, sewing machines were harder to get. And the price of that machine jumped up to a thousand dollars. So every time somebody bought one, I probably made 50 to $75. And a lot of people bought from that link. So I'll say this too. If you have a video that does really well or a series of videos, keep making those types of videos. Strike while the iron is hot. I think one mistake I made is that even though these were doing gangbusters, I kept doing other vid rando videos. And I should have just did, I should have gone a lot harder on making videos about the PE 800. Then the PE 900 came out about a year or two ago. So I bought that one as well to try to make videos on it. And those did pretty well, but not as good as the PE 800. And also the PE 900 was way more expensive. But then I also saw Brother was making this machine. This is called the Brother Sketch. And this is a very, it's a very weird machine for the industry. And it was only 500 bucks. So I was like, I think I can make the ad revenue back if I get the machine. And what I didn't realize, and that this video did pretty well. I think it'll do better over time because this is actually kind of a controversial embroidery machine because Brother has made it so that the it's controlled solely via an app and people are very upset about it. And when they first released the machine, all of the features to all of the good features that you would need to use it were behind a paywall that costs twelve dollars and ninety nine cents a month. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of sick of everything turning into a subscription. So I did a few videos explaining to people because I felt like the company was kind of trying to hide the fact that in order to really use this, you had to pay thirteen dollars a month. So I did a few videos and people that they kind of gained traction just because of like they were a little more polarizing and people were very upset about what brother was doing with the paywall and with the app stuff. And after I did the videos, I got an email from brother, which I ignored. And then they ended up changing the policy to put the important features in the free version. So I was very happy to possibly contribute to a positive thing a positive change that this company did because a lot of people didn't know that about it. It got, it definitely paid for itself just in the ad revenue. I can continue to make more videos with the machine. So sometimes it's good to invest in things that you know are going to be sort of hot in your niche that are popular, that are new. And the CPM for these videos are also over $30. But um, just in one example, you know, that you can get something that's kind of new and talked about and buy it. I also bought another piece of tech that was fairly expensive for the channel that I'm going to do videos on just because people want to see real reviews. And I think one thing that people appreciate about my channel is that these are not sponsored videos. I paid for it myself. So I think viewers feel like they can trust the information more because I went out and bought it with my own money. And I don't have to worry about the company kind of interjecting with the content or trying to tell me what to say or, you know, like getting their bad list. I don't really care. And I'm making enough. I, I feel like at this level, I think one positive thing about having a sizable channel is that you can then have the money to buy things yourself and not again. I, I understand as a small creator, it's hard and you kind of do have to rely sometimes on getting free products. But I am sort of glad to be in a position where I have a little bit more leverage with these companies and where I can also afford to buy equipment myself to review. So I love that story. And it uh, is cool to hear your results. And this is one of my favorite strategies. We call it RSP, Review Specific Products, mm -hmm. or TSS, Teach Specific Skills, related to something that a community loves. What you've been doing with sewing machines, I did so deeply with cameras and tripods and tech and lighting, and then connecting that to affiliate marketing. And as a reminder, we're going to be going deeper into this on day five, but this is one of the biggest aspects of Video Ranking Academy. Again, not that it's the only strategy or that it needs to apply all the time to all of us, but when you're just starting out, you're able to review somebody else's product. You don't have to create your own. You talk about somebody else's thing. You don't have to worry about shipping or fulfillment or customer service. Through the power of affiliate marketing, you shared so many nuggets there. 
and um, stick uh, around because we will be covering more of that on session number five. And also, um, if you are inside of Video Ranking Academy or um, you've jumped in, like this is just, again, such a great way to start and a great way to create passive income. Rank a video connected to affiliate marketing. So that's being viewed like Jen talked about, ad revenue can come in over the years and even thousands of dollars in affiliate income. And those numbers can go up and down and um, different things can shift. But imagine having 10 videos ranked bring you passive income, 30 videos ranked bring you passive income. That was how I was originally able to go full time doing this with a tech channel um, called Think Media was talking about cameras, talking about lighting, talking about software, ranking videos, and then eventually replacing my income so I could be my own boss and start building up what Think Media is today. Okay, we have, thank you for your patience, Rad. Number, number 10 out of our 10 tips is commit to the process. How do we create more videos in less time? is commit to the process. I'm gonna hit Rad, then we'll hit Jennifer. We gotta let them go. They've been so generous. Uh, we're 30 minutes past the hour here, but um, let's land the plane here. At the end of the day, Thomas Edison said, opportunity is missed by most people because it's dressed in overalls and it looks like work. And so talk, Rad, a little bit about you. Last time you were on the show, you talked about commit to learning and growing and putting in the work. Share a little bit about just the mindset and looking back over the years for all of us, what we can learn from about the power of commitment. I think a lot of people get caught up in their heads. One of the things that I really reflected on last year, I, I had to think about where a lot of my wasted time was. And there is just so much time that I think we as humans, and I'll speak personally, that even at my stage, I would just be sitting there and I'd be thinking about things or I'd go to my phone to break like the focus of trying to work and I'd start scrolling and then I'd catch myself and go, oh, what am I doing? And, you know, I learned something from Alex Harmozy that I thought was really, really good. And he talks about like figure out the inputs that have the greatest leverage that create the outputs that have the biggest impact on your business. And so you work out what those inputs are. And for me, the, it, it is actually making YouTube videos because I actually got the statistic wrong. I looked it up when I was off camera. 76% of my business comes from YouTube. So it made it was really, really clear when I would look at all the tasks that I do in a day and I thought, okay, well, making YouTube videos creates the most business for my company than anything else. So I'm just going to focus on being able to get as many good quality videos done as I can. And like, there's an example, I, I, that video that I made that I talked about that went viral on Instagram and doubled my subscribers. I made a really bad mistake in something I said. I was meant to say when I'm teaching how to do it, I was meant to say, make your feet double shoulder width apart. But I said, bring your feet to shoulder width apart. And I clearly go double shoulder width apart. And so many people have gone, man, this dude doesn't know what shoulder width apart is. Some people have even been really rude about it. Some people have called me like, you're effing stupid and stuff. And rather than take the video down, I just comment to all of them. And I've even, I have to comment so many times. I have a saved template on my phone where I just copy and paste it, where I just say, yeah, I was meant to say double shoulder with the part. Oops. And then I did that emoji. And then people always laugh about it. And it's this idea of like, so the, the lesson behind that is even when you see imperfections, that's not a reason for me to not put a video up because if the video is getting views and funnily enough, if it gets comments from people hating on it, that's engagement. That's telling the algorithm, this is a good video. People are watching and people watch the video twice to comment on it. And then if you can engage in a way that, that, that is meaningful and most people like the people that are worthwhile, they laugh at it. And so, you know, if you just commit to doing the thing, don't worry if it's perfect or not, because the, the, the best video is the next video. And version one is always better than version none. Like that was my tip that I gave last time I did this. And I, I cannot emphasize that enough. Version one is better than version none. It doesn't matter. Like there comes a point where you're looking at it thinking, oh, how can I make this video any better? Don't worry about it. Just get it up there and get the next video out because it's just like every video is going to be better than the last one. And if you commit to the VRA process of 1% better every time, you you like within a hundred videos, you and you'd be surprised as to how quickly that happens. It might seem so far away for you at the start, but if you just commit to the process, and th the other thing that I would say is, without the risk of rambling, is 
goals are great and goals are an idea, but it's the systems, it's the habits that matter. So if you have a goal to get to a thousand subscribers, that's great, but don't focus on that. Just focus on making the video. And then you focus on making the next video. And if you follow the VRA process, you know, you're focusing on, okay, research, what's my idea? What am I going to do? Okay, I've got my idea. I'm going to do this. And you, and you just commit to it and do it. Rad, thank you so much for that tip. We're going to have Jen land the plane in just a second, but uh, on uh, where can people follow you? Where can people connect with you? If people want to get in shape, if they want to, from home, be able to learn a lot, you have such good free content, but of course, also you've got some products and programs. So Rad, shout out your stuff. Of course, uh, YouTube is by far my uh, like pillar content. So if you just search for Unity Gym, and you'll you'll find us there, or you can do at Unity Gym online, and that's by far that's where all my best stuff goes. Uh, I'm on all socials, you know, so we're on Instagram and Twitter and everything else, but it's just repurposed YouTube content, which is a great tip. Uh, and then my website, UnityGym.com, is where everything is. But to get started, we have that free blueprint that you've got there. That's a really valuable piece of uh, content there. But yeah, if you go to UnityGym.com, that's where I. We offer two flexibility programs and then my online coaching. And my online coaching is all about combining strength and flexibility uh, together into the same workout. So that's it. Show some love for Rad in the chat. Rad, thank you so mm -hmm. much. Appreciate you. So many bombs dropped. And uh, tip number 10 is commit to the process. Version one is better than version none. Get started. Punch fear in the face. Commitment is the foundation of all great accomplishments. But I do want to hear a shout out uh, after Jen shares her thoughts on this. Jen, you've you've been successful in multiple different arenas. Like all of us that have done anything, though, you've also experienced the pain and the pressure and the challenges that come with doing anything. What have you learned about the power of committing to the process and persevering? Yeah, I... I would say this, if you want to be a full-time content creator, you really have to love this you, or learn to love. There are some certainly some non-fun things you have to do as a content creator, but I think if I didn't, if I wasn't truly passionate about this and I didn't really love making the videos, I, there's no way I would be able to, to do this full-time self-employed for the past six years or so. Um, so yeah, I think Rad's right that you do need, you know, you do have to really be committed because this is not an easy path. I think our, our mutual friend, Roberto Blake, he always drops some stats on how many videos actually get over 10,000 views or how many channels actually have 100,000 subscribers. And there's, I think for the silver play button, it's like less than one, it's definitely less than 1%. Um, in fact, most channels don't even have 10,000 subscribers. So going this road, I think people... People think it looks kind of, e they're like, oh, whatever, there's not much to it, but it's it's not an easy thing to do. And it's definitely not easy to sustain over a long period of time. Uh, there's going to be some periods where you're like, I don't know, like as we've seen now, there's a, lot, a trend of YouTubers quitting. So a lot of people doing this for the long run is, you. it's not easy. You can get burnout, you know, you feel unsure of yourself or sometimes your channel might not be doing that. I've had some high, high and low periods for sure. Um, but I think I, you know, I keep getting inspired and I keep trying to make the channel better and the content better. And, you know, and I think there's also some very exciting things happening with the YouTube platform and with live streaming. YouTube is constantly coming out with new tools to make things better for creators. I think with AI and technology, content creation is going to get easier, but that still doesn't negate you being a good storyteller and you making content people want to watch. Such great tips. So. And, uh, you know, I love, you know, one of our hopes is that people hear the message too. Like, we're not saying this is a get rich yeah. quick thing. We're not saying this is easy. Um, and one of our biggest passions in why we're obsessed, we've always been obsessed with systems, uh, but even in 2024 is as we look at the possibility for fatigue and how can this be sustainable? And so many people have values here of peace of mind and serenity and family and kids and not making their whole life about business or anything else. And so, so I, the, how, what is the wisdom it takes? What are the systems we can apply to every area so that we can still be standing uh, three years, six years, 10 years later doing this 
And as Steve Jobs said, business is a game of attrition yeah. and that people will, will fall off. Sometimes maybe we go too hard and, you know, Jen, I don't know if you know, cause we talk about, we want to help 1 million purpose driven people create a full-time living, doing what they love on YouTube, but experience that success without losing their soul. Just knowing that sometimes this creator journey can be all consuming, but that would be the wrong approach. If we go all in, uh, I heard Layla Hermosi talk about that too. We don't, we actually don't get burnt out from hard work. We get burnt out if we're not doing work we truly love and we don't find really the right rhythm. I think if you've got so Shelby Church's video about this whole thing too, who's been in it since she was like 13 or something, still going, but not as hard as some people went. The idea of a marathon, it's a marathon and not a sprint. The idea of a marathon is you don't run a marathon like a hundred meter dash. You don't run a marathon like a sprint race. You pace yourself. You hydrate along the way. You get a little gel shot to get some electrolytes and nutrition along the way because there's a lot of mileage there. And so our hope is that in this challenge, people can learn a better way to do to approach these creator type of businesses. So Jen, thank you so much. Massive love. Let us know what was your aha from Rad? What was your aha Ooh. from Jen? What did you like best? And then shout out what you're doing. I love it. We can look at all the channels and so people could see and expect the different things you're doing. So uh, let us know where people can connect, connect with you. Yeah, sure. I'm at the sewing report. Um, I don't. And you know what? I think that's Rad's success, especially with his sales boom. I think that also shows that the best way to use YouTube is if you're promoting your own business. And that's the thing, I'm, I've struggled with that a little bit more because I have an Etsy shop where I sell sewing supplies, but I'm not promoting like a gym or promote, you know, like, so I think you need to figure out what is the business if you wanna do this full time and actually make money, what's the business angle? And I think that's one area where I could probably improve myself. Uh, you know, I don't really have a lot to sell other than the sewing supplies. Uh, diversify your income. Try to find different ways. Uh, not Don't just rely on YouTube AdSense for sure. Uh, one, I, I previously worked with a real estate client and she made way more money from her much smaller channel because she was selling an expensive product. So if you're used, like if you have, and I think I see a lot of business owners that don't really take advantage of, like I was telling a guy yesterday, you know, I was advising him. I was like, you should do a channel on your business. Look at what you can do. I mean, there's so many things you can do with YouTube. If you have a small business or even a large business, there's really no reason you shouldn't be trying to use YouTube for your marketing because it can really take you places you never thought you could get. Um, and you know, I know a lot of creators are kind of suffering the burnout. And I gotta say, I don't, I haven't really had the burnout um, thing happen to me. I still feel like I've, I'm about seven years in. I still feel like I have a ton left in the tank and fresh video ideas. So I think you also have to realize what channel can you do that has a long shelf life that's still gonna be relevant in 20 years? Because if you wanna have this be your career, you know, it can't be on like a fad or something that's kind of short term, but something that's uh, something that has a lot that will still be relevant 10, 20 years from now. And something that where you can keep coming up with new video ideas without running out. So I think if you can figure that out, that'll really help. Uh, but yeah, I haven't, luckily I haven't really experienced that. I can definitely empathize with those people, but I haven't really experienced that myself. Oh man, it's so encouraging to hear. And it sounds because, I mean, I think wisdom is a better way and you shared so much wisdom today. That was a bomb right there. What, what channel could you commit to? That's not gonna be yeah. a fad, man, I mean, Sometimes in the internet and people that watch, you know, or that are drop shipping crypto and all these things are cool, yeah. but certain fads come and go. I'm not suggesting both of those things are great, but, but there are certain fads like, and, and so we want to be calculated so wise to like, look ahead and think about sewing is a great point. There's always going to be sewing and crafting and DIY culture, and it's going to evolve and there's going to be new brother machines that have apps and different things to navigate through. But being positioned well is such a key to longevity. Jen, thank you so much. Thank you so much for years ago investing in VRA and being a part of our community and also just being such a world class human being. Um, in, uh, you know, we've ran into each other at events and, and I know you're you're so engaged in the creator economy overall. 
and uh, you just have an incredible reputation and such a great spirit. And people are loving. I hope you're seeing the chat. Thank you. All of the wisdom <laughs> and that you share. Yes, don't if you can. Don't use a teleprompter. It's gonna be. Don't if you're starting out. Get. I think later on, if you try to use the teleprompter, it won't be as much of a crutch. Real time story. I when I was working at a TV station years ago, I had a coworker who was a new reporter. And she, there was some breaking news and she literally wouldn't go to this assignment because she wouldn't have any scripts. So she, again, that doesn't look good when you're at work and you're turning down an assignment because you literally can't ad lib anything. Uh, so I think the ability to ad lib, the ability to speak freely is probably one of the biggest advantages you can have as a creator and as an, a personality that will give you an edge over all the people that are relying on just reading what reading something so good we'll give it up jen we're sending you massive love and appreciation your time is so valuable so thank you for spending it with us today if you enjoyed this content and want to take your youtube channel to the next level just click or tap the link on the screen or go to tube1kchallenge.com to join our next live youtube challenge you'll learn our best tips and strategies that are working here at think media and i think you'll love it